Welcome to NCCP, a United Methodist community featuring locations at Grace, Greenmount, and St. John's in Hampstead and Upper Cove, Maryland. You can also find us online at nccpumc.com and on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. back up for just a moment to review where we have been because we remember that Job lost everything that he had all of his cattle his home his ten children he he was covered in sores from head to toe and his friends came and they showed up and they sat with him for a week and that was a blessing to him until they opened their mouths and then they said things to him like, you must have done something wrong. You have to be getting what you deserve. Your heart is not in the right place. And yet Job's, Job's this righteous man. He had done everything right up until then. He was just caught up in this heavenly court and play between God and Satan to see how faithful he would be. And so Job hears what his friends have to say. And if you've been doing your homework, you've been reading through the book of Job, you know that there is a lot that Job says, not just to his friends, but also to God. That's one of the greatest things we can learn from this passage, this, this body of scripture, is that when we are angry with God, when we are hurt and in a terrible place, it is okay to cry out to God and to tell the Lord how we feel about what has taken place. Because God is big enough to handle it. God is the one who created us, and God knows our hearts and knows we feel that way anyway. And so we never have to feel like we can't cry out that way in hurt and in pain and in despair. And so we find Job here. And we find that there is going to be reconciliation. The Lord is actually angry with Eliphaz. He's angry with these friends. And why he's angry at them is because what they said to Job about his plight is untrue. What they said to Job about God being a God who gives us what we deserve, a God who, who will meet us out punishment because of our hearts, what he is saying is not true. Because we spoke last week about how the truth is, what we know of God is, that none of us get what we deserve from God, right? Because we deserve punishment, we deserve retribution, we deserve heaps of pain. But God is a God of grace and a God of mercy. Even our communion liturgy reminds us that when we turned away and our love fails, it's God's love that remains steadfast. Through everything that we face, whether we recognize it or not, God is holding on to us. God is present in the midst of it. And so God is angry with Job's friends because they have not spoken truthfully about this God of mercy and this God of grace. God knows more than anyone that Job doesn't deserve what he's got. And God is going to make that right, but first, he has to bring a lesson to Job's friends. Now, if you notice in this scripture, before we even get to all that God does to restore Job, he speaks to Eliphaz, and he says, I'm angry at you and your two friends because you haven't spoken correctly about me. And so he tells them that they have to go and make an offering to him. They have to go to Job, take these seven bulls and seven rams, and here's the tricky part. They have to have Job pray for them. Now think about this. Here's something that we've noticed throughout this book of Scripture. All of the times that Job's friends are speaking to him, all of them are talking about God. But they're never talking to God. 
Job is the only one in this book who actually talks to God, who actually prays to God. So what that teaches us is that God isn't very pleased with people who talk a lot about him but don't talk to him. Amen? Because what we find is his friends, Job's friends, do a lot of theologizing. They spend a lot of time pondering the mysteries of God and, and speaking on behalf of God without never, without ever taking the time to get on their knees and seek the face of God and find how it is they should have responded to their friend. Oh, Lord, how many of us do that? We try to talk about God all the time when God wants us to talk to him so that he can speak through us. And so God tells Job's friends, you've got to take these rams and we're going to make this right by having Job pray for you. Now I want you to think about for a moment, what if you were like Job and you've been wronged by, by God and, and Satan and all of your friends and you are feeling utterly despised. And you've been speaking to God about your plight, but you're still covered in sores and sitting in ashes. And these friends come to you and say, now I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray to God on behalf of me. You know, our human nature is one where we, we all would say the same thing Job's friends would say at that moment. You don't deserve for me to pray for you. You don't deserve for me to make a sacrifice on your behalf. You don't have your hearts in the right place because you can talk all about God, but you never talk to God. You're getting everything that God is supposed to give you because you deserve it. How many times do we say that about people who have harmed us? It's just human nature. That's what we want to do. But Job here gives us a different view of that. Because when his friends come to him, when they say, we need you to pray on our behalf, Job does just as he's been asked. Eliphaz from Teman, Bildad from Shua, and Zophar from Nama did what the Lord told them, and the Lord acted favorably toward Job. That's what reconciliation with our friends looks like. Sometimes it's when we are the ones who've been wronged, when we are the ones who are most hurt, it's upon us to pray on behalf of our friends, to help make that reconciliation possible. We can't always wait for them to pray for themselves. They might not have the capacity to do that. But if we extend God's grace and God's mercy toward them, when they come to us and say, please pray for me, we're called to do just that. And that's what we find Job doing. And the funny thing is, we don't even see here that his condition has improved at all. From what we understand in this scripture, he is still covered in sores, sitting in ashes. He's still experiencing all of that pain and all of that loss, but he still makes this offering on behalf of his friends. Praise to God that they may be forgiven for not speaking correctly about God. And here is where we see everything start to change for Job. The Lord changed Job's fortune when he prayed for his friends. When he prayed for his friends, God doubled all that he had. All of that wealth that he lost, he had twice as much. All of that pain was taken away from him, and we find all his brothers and sisters and acquaintances came to him and ate food with him in his house. Where were all of these people when he was in pain? Brothers and sisters and acquaintances? We don't hear anything about them in this whole book. But did Job turn them away? No. Even though they weren't there for him at the worst moment of his life, when even his wife was saying, curse God and die, and these three friends were saying all the wrong things, Job still extends to them this hospitality that as God is returning his fortunes to him, 
he could still eat and drink and celebrate with all of them. They comforted and they consoled Job concerning all the disaster that had been brought upon him by the Lord. And they all came and they brought him rings and they blessed him. And then the Lord blessed Job's later days. Again, he had seven sons and three daughters. It doesn't make up for the ones that he lost. You can never make up for that kind of loss. And it never tells us that Job got over all of the pain that he experienced. It never says that Job was finally okay with what happened. The scripture never says that. But it says that he named his daughters, and that's something new. You know, in Hebrew scriptures, women don't get named very often. So in the beginning, we didn't know anything about who his daughters were. But here in the end, we know that they're the most beautiful women in the world. And not only does he name them, but he gives them an inheritance. What that shows us is that all Job has come through, all that he's experienced, what it makes him even more sensitive to those who have nothing. And when women have nothing in the world, when they're in a culture that does not allow for them to own anything and to have an inheritance, Job reverses that. He gives his daughters something that's going to be theirs forever and ever. And then what we also find is after all of this, Job lived 140 years. He saw four generations beyond his children and again, it doesn't tell us that he had mended all of that heartbreak, but it does say that Job died old and satisfied. God reversed all of that. He restored all that had been taken, all that had been lost. But now we, as people of God, are called to share lives with one another in this way. That when, even when our friends don't deserve our mercy, we speak of a God who offers that grace. Even when our friends don't have their hearts in the right place, we pray for them and on behalf of them. We give voice to what they can't say. And when those come, who have hurt us most sometimes come to us and seek that we offer prayers on their behalf, that we need to go to God on their behalf, <clears throat> that we as God's people do that. It doesn't tell us what Job prayed for his friends. But if we think about it through scripture, if we wonder a little bit together, one theologian says that what their prayer probably, what Job's prayer probably sounded like most was Father forgive them for they know not what they do. Just as Christ prayed for those upon the cross to his left and to his right, just as Christ prayed for all of those who were putting him to death when he had done nothing to deserve that, that is the model that all of us have and that we see here throughout Scripture. So may God grant us grace and mercy that in our days of heartache and our days of sorrow and our days of pain, we may still pray for those around us. Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. And may all of us receive from God double what we've lost. May all of us receive from God the age and the satisfaction that Job received as we are faithful through all of our days. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray.